All right, welcome back to the next episode of The Keto Naturopath. I'm Dr. Carl Goldcamp. I want to inspire you today. I'm going to inspire you today to take action on something I hope you'll do tomorrow. We're going to talk about glutathione, but I'm going to give you two ideas, something can power in your hands that you can make a dramatic change in your life with just these two things. I'm not exaggerating. That's why I have to sort of give you a good presentation so you believe it, that you'll go to sleep thinking about it, and you'll wake up tomorrow morning still focused on wanting to take action for yourselves or for somebody else you might care about, but start with yourself first, okay? So what is this? All right, common problems that lead to glutathione deficiency and what to do about it will be one thing. Testing and supplementation for glutathione deficiency, since that's been requested, but I want to go bigger than that. That's what I feel responsible to cover. Let's go bigger. Okay, we've talked about some of this before. Conditions associated with glutathione deficiency, rather conditions that are improved when taking glutathione. Specific conditions, age-related macular degeneration, allergies, cancer, ALS, COPD, cystic fibrosis, Parkinson's, vocal cord polyps, Generally, so those are really specific. That it means there's a lot of documentation on that and there's no real alternative. It's they know, yes, there's a big glutathione deficiency in those specific, specific situations. Okay, um, general conditions, anemia, frequent infections, seizures, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, loss of coordination, liver disease, of course, heart attack and stroke. We've talked a little bit about this, so I'm not gonna go very deep on those. But we will get into a little neurologic thing. So ALS, which is called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, otherwise known as Lou Gehrig's disease, or Woody Guthrie disease, or Sam Shepard, if you're familiar with any of his plays, or he's an actor, he's a favorite of mine. All of these people, all these men, died from Lou Gehrig's disease. Many other people did too. What is that? It's oxidative stress that has caused a disease, pathogenesis disease. Of, and it stopped the working of motor nerves. Gradually got worse and worse and worse. Once you sort of break in to the nerve system and create a problem, it just tends to get larger, unless you do something about it. We investigated, this is a study right down here, we investigated in vivo motor cortex glutathione levels in ALS. Glutathione levels were reduced by 30% compared to healthy adults. Glutathione might be a promising biomarker for upper motor neuron function in ALS. So this is basically what they're after, is glutathione deficiency is in ALS. So do you think that maybe if you either did something that supported glutathione production in a person like this, or gave them glutathione that actually got to the red blood cells, got in, you know, not it's not food, you basically have to do a supplement if you're gonna be serious about this in these situations. Okay, rates of brain atrophy may depend on omega-3 fatty acids and B vitamins. Huh? What's that about? New study investigates the impact of low vitamin B12, high homocysteine levels in Parkinson's disease. PD, Parkinson's disease, is a reduction in the levels of glutathione. I told you it was on that list. So wait a minute. We, said, we talked about low glutathione, and over here it's about fish oil, DHA and EPA may determine whether B vitamins can slow brain shrinking. So they're saying, wait a minute, it's not just taking vitamins, it's your omega-3s. Hmm. These are studies, of course. But wait, isn't there more to what causes Parkinson's? You must have heard a little extra. Pesticides are also linked to Parkinson's. Hmm. Paraquat is used in crops as they grow. And another one called Maneb prevents post-harvesting spoiling. So they spray on a lot of crops, especially in the Midwest, but really any place they have crops, uh, any farm, um, even corn stock and so on. It is believed pesticides may contribute to dopamin dopaminergic neuron death. In other words, the inability to produce dopamines. So what does that have to do with? Parkinson's is an inability to produce enough dopamine in a place in the central part of your brain called your substantia nigra, which is really in your motor center, your motor neurons. So it stops working. We're gonna get into that a little detail here. So low level exposure may mimic the effects of mutations that are caused, that some people just have mutations. 
Okay, people exposed to these chemicals have about 250% higher risk of developing Parkinson's. The study uncovers pesticides, and so there you go on that. All right, what is Parkinson's? If you don't know what Parkinson's is, it's the inability to move quickly and you shuffle. Having had a few patients I've worked with, and uh, I don't think I did much for them actually, I wasn't this aware of these situations back when I was practicing with them anyway. One woman just wanted me to do acupuncture on her, so I wish she would come in twice a week to do acupuncture. So we got to know each other well, but um, we didn't go here. And it's primarily a man's disease, by the way. Parkinson's uh, hits men much more than it hits women. There's a map of the United States. They're redoing the statistics as we speak in the United States, but basically it's a shuffle. And this woman who was a writer and an English teacher who I got to know, and her, her mind is obviously very bright and so on, she talked about how her body was becoming caned, like a cane. She couldn't move it. And uh, it was hard. It was hard to watch that, hard to be part of it. Um, I enjoyed being with her. These are people that you know who have had Parkinson's. Ellen Alda, Muhammad Ali. So Muhammad Ali, who um, died in 2016, he had it for nearly 30 years. And you can say, well, it's head trauma. Perhaps. George Bush, the father, Neil Diamond. Michael J. Fox has had it for almost 30 years as well. That's pretty impressive. And he has a whole institute about this. Linda Ronstadt, Dave Jennings, if you're into sports, New York Giants, Pope John Paul, Billy Graham. So Billy Graham had it for the last 20 or 30 years of his life, 20, almost 30 years of his life. Jesse Jackson, Bob Hoskins, the actor, if you know, um, Milton Nash, if you're Canadian, Canadian broadcaster, and Janet Reno, the attorney general. I liked her a lot. Um, she worked with my brother and she was the attorney general under Clinton. Okay, key cause and diseases affecting the brain. Uncontrolled free radical damage. So that's the key. So we have now a problem. It's kind of general. Uncontrolled free radical damage. Isn't that like a little bit too fuzzy? Not specific enough? But it includes schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS. Glutathione deficiency is the main factor. Glutathione deficiency is the main factor. So if you go back to any of those guys we just looked at, Let's say take Alan Alda. Well, he was diagnosed but six years ago and saying, hey, we're going to give you some glutathione. He probably doesn't know about this now. Feel free to contact him. Um, Michael J. Fox, he seems pretty aware. I don't know, but he's tried a lot of different things. But glutathione, if these people at the beginning of their symptomology started having this, started taking, and these didn't exist before. So you have supplements now that are, are do go into the bloodstream. You have liposomal, you have acetyl, um, certainly you have NAC, which is a precursor. We'll get into some of that. But now you have things you didn't have before. This wasn't available. So when somebody did get Parkinson's, there wasn't much you could do for them other than to do acupuncture <laughs> or whatever. Okay, so back to this. The area that makes dopamines in the brains of people with Parkinson's, the Sustantia nigra, contains about 40% less glutathione than the rest of the organ. Consequently, it's being damaged by free radicals, right? So the, the shield is being taken away because of its low glutathione and more risk for free radical damage. Glutathione is a vital treatment option for this situation to get as much glutathione to the brain as possible. We've talked in previous videos about free radical damage and so on and so forth, so I don't feel I have to go into that. Okay, but I'm gonna take a different curve here. Ready? All right, the association of a gene I happen to have, so it wasn't for my reason we're doing this, association of MTHFR, which is methyl, tetra methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, C677T, which is a mutation, which means you cannot methylate B12 and or folic acid as well as other people. And consequently, you may have problems that other people don't have. Some of those problems are it's associated with autism, it's associated with uh, anybody on the spectrum. So I'm dyslexia, in case you hadn't noticed. And um, it goes on. This is just one association. It's not just, you'll, we'll get into it, but I'm saying notice this connection. We're going to put this back into a bigger picture and um, Hopefully you'll find it interesting. The MTHFR C677T polymorphism may elevate homocysteine and increase the risk of Parkinson's disease. 
homocysteine, that's the abbreviation, levels were higher in Parkinson's cases and the controls carrying this particular gene. The meta-analysis suggests that this gene may confer Parkinson's susceptibility. The T allele, which is what this is, may be an independent risk factor for elevated homocysteine level in, in uh, Parkinson's patients. All right, that seems like, why do you need to know about this? Well, in part, you already actually already do. I just took some pictures. If you went onto Google and said Parkinson's and MTHFR, Parkinson's and methylation, you would get article, look at this, homocysteine levels MTHFR, Parkinson's, MTHFR, MTHFR, Parkinson's, Parkinson's, and there's, there's another mutation, COMT, another one. But you see MTHFR, Parkinson's, that's all I'm trying to show you. And in CoQ10, so on and so forth, it's associated. What the heck is that about? Do you remember this? We've talked about this before in a number of videos, certainly the last one I did, so I'm gonna review this. So you understand MTHFR, MTHFR. So both of these are the same diagrams done slightly differently for a reason. And these are common bottlenecks. These are common mutations. They are slow working genes that muck up. If you remember last time I told these about traffic circles, these are inter, linking cycles, neurotransmitter synthesis. Remember you heard about the dopamine, uh, folic acid, methyl, uh, methylation, and this is where glutathione is made. So let's call this whole thing a glutathione factory, right? So this is, and here's another picture of it. I just simply put this because it also shows cofactors. Vitamins are cofactors, vitamin B6, methionine, SAMI, you might have heard of that. Um, so we have B6, we have folic acid, B12, B2, and it goes on from there. Serine, I could have added in. But let's call all of this nothing more than a glutathione factory. And a factory that makes, you know, when you put all these cofactors in and you have a healthy diet and you overcome all these mutations, what are you going to get? You're going to get this nice, refined, few drops of glutathione. And when you have a few drops on a regular basis of glutathione, everything in life just kind of gets better. Your sleep gets better. Your cognitive abilities get better. Your joint pains get better, whether they are disease from arthritis, be it osteo or rheumatoid. I'm not saying they're going to get completely better. I'm going to say from that point forward, if you can make this glutathione or get this glutathione, suddenly things go away. The rash on your arm and all these inflammatory conditions that are actually interrelated, but you probably don't know that. So glutathione, and I mentioned this because we now know these problems that these people have, certainly in Parkinson's, are because part of that glutathione machine is a little gummed up. It goes slowly here. So for these three traffic circles, if you said, well, one traffic circle and a little bit of a backup we could probably do with that. Well, what another one and another one, you're going to have a pretty slow traffic and you're going to be rather deficient in glutathione and your ability to make it. So one way you can save on your glutathione is by removing the reasons to use it. What does that mean? Oxidative stress, stress of any sort, right? These are what they look like, right? This is a, a genomic report. I just called out three, not to be too long about it, but this, this is a C677T. This is, I have, Judy has that. Uh, we're pretty much identical to this. And this happened to be a client of ours who has di diabetes in a family history of addiction. That's that situation. At the time when I was working with him, I didn't ask if he had a family history of any neurological situations, but neurological and um, mental diseases are neck and neck. Both have to do with nerves. Both have to do with neurotransmitters. Think of the big picture. Don't get too stuck with the with the details here. This is just saying these are micronutrient deficiencies. Micronutrients are vitamins. Micronutrients are amino acids. Micronutrient deficiencies. Ran this panel and I've shown this before. Glutathione and cysteine, both, well, cysteine is necessary for glutathione. Deficient here, borderline deficient there. Glutamine is necessary for, gl for glutathione manufacture, production, creation. Serine is necessary. So here you have one, two, borderline three things that are necessary for glutathione creation. Do you think this person's going to have a problem? So this person's going to have a problem in any sort of inflammatory way, whether it's certainly diabetes is an inflammatory condition, but it makes sense. There's a logic here. I'm trying to overlay it with a logic of things we can do. We can fix this. 
Okay, here's just a bigger picture saying, all right, if you have these deficiencies, which are marked in red, I didn't show you the whole report, how do you think their mitochondria is gonna work out? How do you think their ability to be able to make energy, nerve transmission, et cetera, et cetera, however you wanna think of it, is going to be difficult? There's alpha lipoic acid, that's calcium, there's serine, glutamine, glutamine, copper, um, alpha lipoic acid, zinc, folic acid, cysteine, B3, carnitine, vitamin E. Here's another picture of showing what I've shown you before. It's the same loops, the same traffic circles of you, just illustrated slightly differently. But what I wanna show you is that this is the end of the whole glutathione factory, right? This is your glutathione factory. These are all the cogs and the wheels going together. And so this is why people talk so much about glutathione. It is needed everywhere. It's made primarily in the liver, and it lives primarily in the liver. It's also in the brain. Um, and that's why when people go, oh, here's NAC, N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is the rate-limiting step in making glutathione. And so if you supply that, well, you're closer to the end. What they don't show in this particular illustration, to keep it simple, is there's one more enzyme there, which may or may not, may not be a problem. It's usually not a problem for most people. And then, of course, you add glycine. Glycine's ubiquitous. It's only uh, cysteine that you're worried about. But that's why glutathione... And now, in this last less than 10 years, they've come to liposomal and acetylglutathione, things you could actually take and you have glutathione. Bang! So can you imagine if you, any of those people that I showed you, if you said, hey, just try this, you would probably have, depending how advanced they are and how much damage has actually already been created, you would probably pull back on some of those issues and some of those um, symptoms. Pretty interesting, huh? The times are not like they were. So this is on the what you can do about it and trying to give you a larger context and understanding it. So this is the bottom of that same big loop, right? There's the homocysteine. So in Parkinson's, you said homocysteine is elevated. Well, there's serine, right? So that guy who we saw was had serine deficiency, had cysteine deficiency, and had glutamine. This is where glutamine that comes in here. It's like, hey, it's probably not going to have much in the way of glutathione. That's the shorthand for glutathione. So NSE comes in there. So you have different ways to feed into that last little piece. Remember, it's a glutathione factory. And the idea of this glutathione factory is to squeeze out at the end of the day just enough lovely drops of glutathione so you go, oh, I got a good sleep tonight. You know, I'm going to wake up refreshed with no aches and pains unless you just fell out of a tree or something. Um, but that's the objective. All right, conditions associated with low glutathione at length. Cardiovascular, angina, atherosclerosis, cholesterol, elevated that is, erectile dysfunction, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, immune, acne, allergies, HIV, Lyme disease, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, neurological, here you go, ADHD, Lou Gehrig's disease, we knew that, Alzheimer's, anxiety, autism, bipolar, dementia, depression, Huntington's disease, migraines, had some uh, a motor disease, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, and schizophrenia. Did you know that Parkinson's, the number of Parkinson's cases in the United States is more than double all of the multiple sclerosis and all the double of all the uh, ALS. So it's a lot, a lot of Parkinson's people. Cancer, breast cancers, is right, it makes sense. Unrestrained inflammation is gonna make, uh, free radicals is gonna make a problem. And one of these problems is cancer. It goes nuts. Ovarian, lung, leukemia, colon, cervical breast. Documentation to show that there's glutathione deficiencies exist with these particular situations. Other conditions, thyroid, pancreatic, in inflammatory, and there's uh, macular degeneration, which we're going to get into in a second. So there you go. Obviously, heavy metals would be a contributor. Um, hepatitis would be a cause of. You notice it's in the liver. You know, if you're shy of glutathione, what's, going to, what's the first organ that's going to have a problem? It's going to be your liver, and then it's going to go elsewhere. Okay, age-related macular de degeneration. So this is what it looks like to have macular degeneration. You can't see in the center. And so you basically have a wearing out of the back of the eye. Make a long story short, your retina. It no longer can focus, and so you have to, those who have macular degeneration, they have to look at the sides. And so when they talk to you, they're talking to you this way. They're saying, okay, because they can't see you if you look directly that way. Okay, so what do we have here? We have increase in omega-6 and decrease in omega-3 
polyunsaturated fatty acids, those are essential fatty acids, elevates the risk of H-related macular de degeneration. Okay, it is the combination of too much omega-6 and, and too low antioxidant status that increase the oxidative products of omega-6. That's what they're saying. I just gave you the paraphrasing of that. That's from a study, Oxidative Damage and Age-Related Macular Degeneration, 1999. So it's not exactly new information, and, and you can even go back and find articles well before that that establish this correlation. All right, the incidence, as with all chronic diseases that keep going up, of macular degeneration. It's mostly female, interesting in this situation. Parkinson's was, was mostly male. You basically can see from 2000 to 2010, 10 years, you had not quite a doubling, but a 20% increase in 10 years. I looked for larger and I couldn't quite find all the statistics, but I popped that one in. But you can see it's going up, it's ramping up, as is my point to this next slide. Time to understand the age related, the age in age related macular de degeneration. Why? Why is it age related? What happens with age? You go, oh, well, we get older and we wear out. That's what happens, and eventually we die. That's really wearing out. That wears out so much to the point you died. That's true, that's a little bit too general for me, but why is it we, what are we losing here? You're losing the ability to make glutathione, therefore what you're getting is unrestricted inflammation. You're getting unrestricted free radical damage throughout the body. And in the very sensitive area, so obviously the, the liver would be one place for sure, but also your eye is a very sensitive area in terms of being oxidized. So um, it is well documented with increasing age, aka over 35 and getting younger, one's ability to produce glutathione decreases and therefore their antioxidant status declines. Why? They're not sure, but it's thought to be a consequence and a correlation of declining nutrients, we saw some of that, increased nutrient deficiencies, another way of saying the same thing, declining activity, less exercise, they're more static, they're more sitting around all the time, declining muscle synthesis. Remember we've talked about muscle protein synthesis and having enough protein, especially when you need more protein as you get older, you also need more exercise. You need exercise, not necessarily more exercise. Increase in general inflammation, which that would be the natural outcome, and a decrease in omega-3 fatty acids. You know, all right, now we're back to talking about omega-3s. I thought we were talking about glutathione. Hmm, you're paying attention, I like that. Okay, remember this. This is from before, low glutathione and psychosis with schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. Bang, absolutely, it's a big deal. And that was, what year was that? That was, I can't find the year, maybe you can. Okay, here's my analogy, is that when you start to get low on nutrients, it's like it's like a car that works. Let's say all the cars and the trucks and the worlds, they work. And the only thing we're gonna do, we're gonna take a little air in their tires. We're not, we're not gonna touch the engine, nothing. Take a little air out of their tires. Well, eventually, some cars are gonna have a greater problem than other cars, right? Here's an example. We took out some air in the tires, smack. It's done for, can't move it. But here's a huge truck. We take out a little air in that tire. It's got plenty of other wheels. It's gonna have a problem and it'll be able to fix it, but it's not gonna stop completely. It's not gonna die. So it is the combination of high omega-6 and low omega-3 and chronically low glutathione. That's the clincher. Those are the two ideas. That's the clincher. So we need to look at both of these. So in humans, this is usually their ability to produce sufficient glutathione. Once that starts, once that air starts coming out of the tires, some point you're gonna bottom out. Literally or figuratively, you're gonna bottom out. What did we expect to happen? The average American diet is caloric rich and nutrient poor. This is the new era of starvation for us. I did a few podcasts and I did a YouTube on what they called the Dutch hunger winter of 1944 to 45 in which suddenly the Nazis blockaded in. It was a bad winter and about 4 million people starved. And as they gradually starved, you found out what was happening when you take the air out of the tires. 
And we found there was a, an increased rate of mental disorders, schizophrenia and bipolar specifically, as well as then eventually people died from malnourishment, but specifically high. So we are now nutrient poor and we're high in omega-6 processed foods. We all know that. Okay. Now add to that your glutathione levels being depleted due to rising oxidative stress of your daily life from processed foods, packaged, and seed oils. Whether you're, hopefully you're not using them at home, but maybe you don't know, and maybe you have that big jug of, of uh, soybean oil or corn oil or cottonseed oil. Well, you wouldn't have cottonseed oil, but you'd have one of them. S sunflower oil, safflower oil. All right, so why is the rate of chronic disease skyrocketed? So in 35, 1935, it was only 7.5% of the population had a chronic disease. You can say, well, they were a lot younger. Uh, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's a possibility. But basically, on an apples-to-apples -apples basis, it has increased from 7.5% in roughly, what is that, 70 years, to 60%. 60% of the population in the United States, regardless where they came from, have a chronic disease. That's from the CDC. Why bother? You know, why not just give up and say, "Oh, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I can't do this anymore." This is a the six in ten, sixty percent of the United States have a chronic disease, and four in ten adults have two or more. Forty percent have two or more: heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. Again, CDC. Cancer rates have not decreased. You could arguably say, well, this is 1990 to 2015. They were um, not higher back in the 60s. And so wh why didn't that change? Obesity in America. We all know about this for sure. And this directly has to do with COVID on an omega-6 basis. Obesity in America is caused by omega-6. And why did omega-6, why did COVID have the worst outcomes in the United States more than any other country in the world? Omega-6, you got it. It's a big factor. Obesity rates have risen 40% in the last 20 years and have nearly quadrupled since 1975. That's beyond understanding. So don't be numb to this information. Do not be numb to this information. 